Welcome back. You're the diehards, the people that stay, wait through the rain, and you're at the very end. I'm going to show you this. Somebody left this on one of the seats. This might be the saddest sight you've ever seen on a Bloomsday. Sat through the rain. But the book is so thick that like the middle of this whole text block is totally fine. So I don't know if this is somebody's, if, if you left it out in the rain, I'd like to have it as a memento. I'm happy to give you a new Ulysses if this is yours. Come see me. Um, next up for our Ithaca passage, um, we have uh, two wonderful actors. Uh, Michael Toner is one of the founding readers, uh, founding uh, Bloomsday readers for the Rosenbach. 27 years ago, he started doing this for us. And his Ithacan partner, Mal White, is a fabulous actor who you absolutely love. And who's also in, he has a, has a bit role in the Ulysses movie that came out sometime in the 90s, I think that was, or early 2000s. So please welcome Michael Toner and Mal White. Okay, uh, this is what happens when uh, you're an ex-altar boy and you uh, do too many bloomsdays. You end up getting stigmata as I have blood all over the place here. Anyway, I would very, very briefly, I, I would like to give uh, a brief tribute to a, a wonderful, wonderful person who's 96 years young. She's here today. Uh, she's uh, my Jewish theater mom, Lois Sadaloff. Uh, she would come to every opening night. And Lois, there she is. Many, many years ago, Lois said to me, listen, kid, you're not going to get anywhere in professional theater with an Irish mom. You need a Jewish theater mom. And Lois adopted me, and we're still going. She comes to Bloom Day every year and all my opening nights and, and bakes two wonderful loaves of Irish soda bread, the best you've ever tasted, uh, for me. So I'm deeply honored. Lois, thank you so much. We love you. What parallel courses did Bloom and Stephen follow returning? Starting united both at normal walking pace from Bearsford Place. They followed any order named Lower and Middle Gardner Streets and Mountjoy Square West. Then, at reduced pace, each bearing left Gardner's Place by an inadvertence as far as the farthest corner at Temple Street. Then, at reduced pace, with interruptions of halt, bearing right Temple Street North as far as Hardwick Place, approaching disparate. At relaxed walking pace, they cross both the circus before George's church diametrically, the cord in any circle being less than the act which it subtends. Did Bloom discover common factors of similarity between their respective like and unlike reactions to experience? Both were sensitive to artistic impressions, musical in preference to plastic or pictorial. Both preferred a continental to an insular manner of life, a cisatlantic to a transatlantic place of resonance. Both injurated by early domestic training and an inherited tenacity of heterodox resistance professed their disbelief in many orthodox religious, national, social, and ethical doctrines. Both admitted the alternately stimulating and obtunding influence of heterosexual magnetism. Were their views on some points divergent? Stephen dissented openly from Bloom's views on the importance of dietary and civic self-help, while Bloom dissented tacitly from Stephen's views on the eternal affirmation of the spirit of man in literature. What act did Bloom make on their arrival at their destination? At the house steps of the fourth of the equidifferent uneven numbers, number seven Echo Street, he inserted his hand mechanically into the back pocket of his trousers to obtain his latch key. Was it there? It was in the corresponding pocket of the trousers which he had worn on the day but one preceding. Why was he doubly irritated? Because he had forgotten and because he remembered that he had reminded himself twice not to forget. 
What were then the alternatives before the premeditatedly, respectively, and inadvertently keyless couple? To enter or not to enter, to knock or not to knock. Bloom's decision. A stratagem. Resting his feet on the dwarf wall, he climbed over the area railings, compressed his hat on his head, grasped the two points at the lower union of rails and stiles, lowered his body gradually by its length of five feet, nine inches and a half, to within two feet, ten inches of the area pavement, and allowed his body to move freely in space by separating himself from the railings and crouching in preparation for the impact of the fall. Did he arise uninjured by concussion? Regaining new stable equilibrium, he rose uninjured, though concussed, by the impact. Raised the latch of the area door, gained retarded access to the kitchen through the subjacent scullery, and lit a portable candle. Did the man reappear elsewhere? After a lapse of four minutes, the glimmer of his candle was discernible through the semi-transparent, se semi-circular glass of the fan light above the hall door. The hall door torn gradually on its hinges. In the open space of the doorway, the man reappeared without his hat, with his candle. Which seemed to be, to the horse, to be the predominant qualities of his guest? Confidence in himself, an equal and opposite power of abandonment and recuperation. How did Bloom prepare a collation for a Gentile? He poured into two teacups, two level spoonfuls, four and all of Epsis mm. soluble cocoa, and proceeded according to the directions for use printed on the label, to each adding after sufficient time for infusion, the prescribed ingredients for diffusion, in the manner and the quantity prescribed. Was the guest conscious of, and did he acknowledge these marks of hospitality? His attention was directed to them by his host, Joe Coastly, and he accepted them seriously. As they drank in Joe Coast's serious silence, Epps's mass product, the crater cocoa. What celebration accompany Bloom's frequentative act? Well, concluding by inspection, but erroneously, that his silent companion was engaged in mental composition, he reflected on the pleasures derived from literature of instruction rather than of amusement, as he himself had applied to the works of William Shakespeare more than once for the solution of difficult problems in imaginary or real life. Had he found their solution? In spite of careful and repeated reading of certain classical passages, aided by a glossary, he had derived imperfect conviction from the text, the answers not bearing on all points. What lines concluded his first piece of original verse written by him, potential poet at the age of 11 in 1877, on the occasion of the offering of three prizes of 10 shillings, five shillings, and two and sixpence respectively, for the competition by, given by the Shamrock, a weekly newspaper. An ambition to squint at me verses in print makes me hope that for these you'll find room. If you so condescend, then please place at the end the name of yours truly, L. Bloom. What anagrams had he made on his name in youth? Leopold Bloom. El Padbamool. Moldopalu. Balopadum. Old Olebo, MP. What acrostic upon the abbreviations of his false name had he, kinetic poet, sent to Miss Marion Molly Tweedy on the 14th of February, 1888? Poets oft have sung in rhyme. Of music sweet, their praise divine. Let them hymn it nine times nine. Dearer, fair than song or wine. You are mine. The, the world, world is mine. <laughs> How many previous encounters between host and guest proved their pre-existing acquaintance? Two. The force in a lilac garden of Matthew Dillon's house, Medina Village, Kimmage Road, round town in 1887, in the company of Stephen's mother, Stephen being then of the age of five and reluctant to give his hand in salutation. The second, in a coffee room of Breslin's Hotel on a rainy Sunday in a January of 1892, in the company of Stephen's father and Stephen's grand uncle, Stephen being then five years elder. 
did Bloom accept the invitation to dinner given then by the son and afterwards seconded by the father? Very gratefully, with grateful appreciation, with sincere appreciative gratitude, in appreciatively grateful sincerity of regret, he declined. What? reduced to their simplest reciprocal form, were Bloom's thoughts about Stephen's thoughts about Bloom, and about Stephen's thoughts about Bloom's thoughts about Stephen. He thought that he thought that he was a Jew, whereas he knew that he knew that he knew that he was not. What the enclosures of reticence removed were their respective parentages. Bloom, only born male, transubstantial heir of Rudolf Virag, subsequently Rudolf Bloom, of some Bathley, Vienna, Budapest, Milan, London, and Dublin, and of Ellen Higgins, second daughter of Julius Higgins, born Caroline, and Fanny Higgins, born Hegarty. Stephen, eldest surviving male, consubstantial heir of Simus, Simon Dennis of Cork and Dublin, and of Mary, daughter of Richard and Christina Goulding, born Greer. What two temperaments did they individually represent? The scientific, the artistic. What suggested scene was then constructed by Stephen? Solitary hotel in Mountain Pass. Autumn, twilight. Fire lit. In dark corner, young man seated. Young woman enters. Restless, solitary, she sits. She goes to window. She stands, she sits. She, twilight, she thinks. On solitary hotel paper, she writes. She thinks, she writes, she sighs. Wheels and hoofs. She hurries out. He comes from his dark corner. He sees his solitary paper. He holds it towards fire. Twilight. He reads solitary. What? In sloping upright and back hands. Queen's Hotel. Queen's Hotel. Queen's Hotel. Queen's Hotel. Queen's what hotel, suggested Queen's scene hotel. was in reconstructed by Bloom? The Queen's Hotel, Ennis County Clare where Rudolf Bloom, Rudolf Virag, died on the evening of the 27th of June, 1886, at some hour unstated, in consequence of an overdose of monkshood, aconite, self-administered in the form of a neuralgic liniment composed of two parts aconite liniment to one of chloroform liniment purchased by him at 10.20 a.m. on the morning of the 27th of June, 1886, at the Medical Hall of Francis Dennehy, 17 Church Street, Ennis. After having, though not in consequence of having, purchased at 3.15 p.m. on the afternoon of the 27th of June, 1886, a new Bota straw hat, extra smart. After having, though not in consequence of having, Purchased at the hour and in the place aforesaid, the toxin aforesaid, at the general drapery store of James Cullen, 4 Main Street, Ennis. Accepting the analogy implied in the guest's parable, which examples of post exilic eminence did he adduce? <clears throat> Three seekers of the pure truth Moses of Egypt, Moses My Money Days, author of Mori Nebuchim, <clears throat> guide of the perplexed. And Moses Mendelssohn, of such eminence that from Moses of Egypt to Moses Mendelssohn, there arose none like Moses Maimon uh, What fragments of verse from the ancient Hebrew and ancient Irish languages were cited with modulations of voice and translation of texts by guest to host and by host to guest? By Stephen. Shul, shul, shul arun, shul go sucker, agas shul go kuen. By Bloom. Kifeloch, harimon ratkatech, mbad lazamitech. Thy temple amid thy hair is as a slice of pomegranate. What was Stephen's auditive sensation? He heard in a profound ancient male unfamiliar melody the accumulation of the past. What was Bloom's visual sensation? He saw in a quick young male familiar 
form the predestination of a future. Did the host encourage his guest to chant in a modulated voice a strange legend on an ally theme? Reassuringly, that their place where none could hear them talk being secluded, reassured the decocted beverages allowing for sub-solid residual sediment of a mechanical nature, water plus sugar plus cream plus cocoa having been consumed. Recite the first major part of the chanted legend. Little Harry Hughes and his schoolfellas all went out for to play ball. And the very first ball little Harry Hughes played, he drove it over the Jude's garden wall. And the very second ball little Harry Hughes played, he broke the Jews' windows all. <laughs> How did the son of Rudolph receive this forced part? Ah, with unmixed feeling, spoiling, a Jew. He heard with pleasure and saw the unbroken kitchen window. Recite the second part minor of the legend. Then out there came the Jew's daughter, and she all dressed in green. Come back, come back, you pretty little boy, and play your ball again. I can't come back, and I won't come back without me schoolfellas all. For if me master heeded here, he'd make it a sorry ball. She took him by the lily-white hand and led him along the hall, until she led him to a room where none could hear him call. He took a penknife out of a pocket and cut off his little head. And now he'll play his ball no more, for he lies among the dead. <laughs> How did the father of Millicent receive this second part? With mixed feelings, unsmiling. He heard and saw with wonder a Jew's daughter, all dressed in green. What proposal did Bloom, diambulist, father of Millie, somnambulist, make to Stephen, noctambulist? To pass in repose the hours between Thursday, proper, and Friday, normal, on an extemporized cubicle in the apartment immediately above the kitchen and immediately adjacent to the sleeping apartment of his host and hostess. Was the proposal of asylum accepted? Promptly, inexplicably, with amicability, gratefully it was declined. Why would a recurrent frustration the more depress him? Because at the critical turning point of human existence, he desired to amend many social conditions, the product of inequality and avarice and international animosity. Why did he desist from speculation? Because it was a task for a superior intelligence to substitute other more acceptable phenomena in the place of the less acceptable phenomena to be removed. Uh, did Stephen participate in his dejection? He affirmed his existence as a conscious, rational animal proceeding syllogistically from the known to the unknown and a conscious, rational reagent between a micro and a macrocosm ineluctably constructed upon the incertitude of the void. Was this affirmation apprehended by Bloom? Not verbally, substantially. What comforted his misapprehension? That as a competent keyless citizen, he had proceeded energetically from the unknown to the known through the incertitude of the void. What did each do at the door of egress? Bloom set the candlestick on the floor. Stephen put his hat on his head. What spectacle confronted them when they, first the host, then the guest, emerged silently, doubly dark, from obscurity by a passage from the rear of the house into the penumbra of the garden. The heaven tree of stars hung with humid night blue fruit. His, Bloom's, logical conclusion, having weighed the matter and allowing for possible error, that it was not a heaven tree, not a heaven grot, not a heaven beast, not a heaven man, that it was a utopia, there being no known method from the known to the unknown, an infinity renderable equally finite by the suppositious apposition of one or more bodies equally of the same and different magnitudes, a mobility of illusory forms immobilized in space, remobilized in air a past which possibly had ceased to exist as a present before its probable spectators had entered actual present existence. 
Was he more convinced of the aesthetic value of the spectacle? Ah, indubitably. In consequence of the reiterated examples of poets in the delirium of the frenzy of attachment, or in the abasement of rejection invoking ardent sympathetic constellations, or the frigidity of the satellite of their planet. What? Visible luminous sign attracted Bloom's who attracted Stephen's gaze. In a second story rear of his Bloom's house, the light of a paraffin oil lamp with oblique shade sh projected on a screen of roller blind supplied by Frank O'Hara, window blind curtain pole and revolving shutter manufacturer, 16 Angel Street. How did he elucidate the mystery of an invisible, attractive person, his wife Marion, Molly Bloom, denoted by a visible, splendid sign, a lamp, with indirect and direct verbal allusions or affirmations, with subdued affection and admiration, with description, with impediment, with suggestion? Both were then silent. Silent, each contemplating the other, in both mirrors of the reciprocal flesh of their his, not his fellow faces. Were they indefinitely inactive? At Stephen's suggestion, at Bloom's instigation, both, for Stephen, then Bloom, in penumbra urinated, their sides contiguous, their organs of micturition reciprocally rendered invisible by manual circumposition, their gazes, first Bloom's, then Stephen's, elevated to the projected luminous and semi-luminous shadow. Similarly, the trajectories of their first sequent, then simultaneous urinations were dissimilar. Bloom's longer, less irruent, in the incomplete form of the bifurcated penultimate alphabetical letter, who in his ultimate year at high school, 1880, had been capable of attaining the point of greatest altitude against the whole concurrent strength of the institution, 120 scholars, 210 scholars. Mm. Stevens, higher, more sibilant, who in the ultimate hours of the previous day had augmented by diuretic consumption an insistent vesicle pressure. What different problems presented themselves to each concerning the invisible, audible, collateral organ of the other? To Bloom, the problems of irritability, tumescence, rigidity, reactivity, dimension, sanitariness, pilosity. To Stephen, the problems of the sacerdotal integrity of Jesus circumcised. One January, holiday of obligation to hear mass and abstain from unnecessary servile work. And the problem as to whether the divine prepuce, the carnal bridal ring of the Holy Roman Apostolic Church, conserved in Calcutta, were deserving of simple, hi simple hyperduly or of the fourth degree of latria, according to the abscission of such divine excrescences as hair and toenail. Mm. What celestial sign was by both simultaneously observed? A star precipitated with great apparent velocity across the firmament from Vega in the Lyre, above the zenith beyond the star group of the Tress of Berenice, towards the zodiacal sign of Leo. How did they take their leave, one of the other, in separation? Standing perpendicular at the same door and on different sides of its base, the lines of their valedictory arms meeting at any point and forming any angle less than the sum of two right angles. W what sound accompanied the union of their tangent, the disunion of their respectively centrifugal and centripetal hands? The sound of the peal of the hour of the night by the chime of the bells in the church of St. George. What echoes of that sound were by both in each horde? By Stephen. Liliato rutilantium, turma circum det, jubilantium te virginum, chorus excipiat. By Bloom. Hey ho, hey ho, hey ho, hey ho. Alone, what did Bloom hear? The double reverberation of retreating feet on the heaven born earth. The double vibration of a Jew's harp in the resonant lane. Alone, what did Bloom feel? The cold of interstellar space, <laughs> thousands of degrees below freezing point, or the absolute zero of Fahrenheit, centigrade, or reamour. 
the incipient intimations of proximate dawn. Of what did bell chime and hand touch and footstep and lone chill remind him? Of companions now in various manners in different places defunct. Percy Apjohn, killed in action, Mother River. Philip Gilligan, Thysis, Jervis Street Hospital. Matthew F. Kane, accidental drowning Dublin Bay. Philip Boisel, Poemia, Hatesbury Street. Michael Hart, Thysis, Mis Mata Misericordiae Hospital. Patrick Dignam, apoplexy, Sandy Mount. Did he remain? With deep inspiration, he returned, retraversing the garden, re entering the passage, re closing the door. With brief suspiration, he reassumed the candle. Reascended the stairs, reapproached the door of the front room, hall floor, and re entered. What suddenly arrested his ingress? The right temporal lobe of the hollow sphere of his cranium came into contact with a solid timber angle where, <laughs> an infinitesimal but sensible fraction of a second later, a painful sensation was located in consequence of antecedent sensations transmitted and registered. What composite asymmetrical image in the mirror then attracted his attention? The image of a solitary, ipso relative, mutable, alio relative man. Why solitary, ipso relative? Brothers and sisters, had he known yet that man's father was his grandfather's son. Why mutable, alio relative? From infancy to maturity, he had resembled his maternal procreatrix. From maturity to senility, he would increasingly resemble his paternal procreator. But what were habitually his final meditations? Of some one sole unique advertisement to cause passers to stop in wonder. A poster novelty with all extraneous excretions excluded reduced to its simplest and most efficient terms, not exceeding the span of casual vision, and congress with the velocity of modern life. What possibility suggested itself? The possibility of exercising virile power of fascination in the not immediate future, after an expensive repast in a private apartment, in the company of an elegant courtesan of corporal beauty, moderately mercenary, variously instructed, a lady by origin. <laughs> Why did Bloom experience a sentiment of remorse? Because in immature impatience he had treated with disrespect certain beliefs and practices. As? The prohibition of the use of flesh meat and milk at one meal. The hebdomadary symposium of incoordinately abstract, perfividly concrete, mercantile co ex religious ex compatriots. The circumcision of male infants. The supernatural character of Judaic scripture. The ineffability of the tetragrammaton, the sanctity of the Sabbath. How did these beliefs and practices now appear to him? not more rational than they had then appeared, not less rational than other beliefs and practices now appeared. What universal binomial denomination would be his as entity and non-entity? Assumed by any or known to none, every man or no man. What tributes his? Honor and gifts of strangers, the friends of every man, a nymph immortal, beauty, the bride of no man. What past consecutive causes, before rising pre-apprehended, of accumulated fatigue did Bloom, before rising, silently recapitulate? The preparation of breakfast. Burnt offering. Intestinal congestion and premeditative defecation. Holy of holies. The bath. Right of John. The funeral. Right of Samuel. The advertisement of Alexander Keyes. Urim and Thummim. The unsubstantial lunch. Right of Melchizedek. The visit to museum and library. Holy place. The book hunt along Bedford Row, Merchant's Arch, Wellington Quay. Simchath Torah. The music in the Armand Hotel. Shira Shirim. The altercation with a truck deal at Troglodyte and Bornand Kiernan's premises. 
Holocaust. A blank period of time, including a car drive, a visit to a house of mourning, a leave-taking. Wilderness. The eroticism produced by feminine exhibitionism. Right of owning. The prolonged delivery of Mrs. Mina Purify. Heave offering. The visit to the disorderly house of Mrs. Bella Cohen, 82 Chiron Street, Lower, and subsequent brawl, and Chance Medley in Beaver Street. Armageddon! <laughs> Nocturnal perambulation to and from the cabman's shelter, but bridge. Atonement. What self-evident enigma, pondered with desultory constancy during 30 years, did Bloom now, having effected natural obscurity by the extinction of artificial light, silently, suddenly comprehend? Where was Moses when the lights went out? Bloom's axe. He deposited articles of clothing on a chair, removed his remaining articles of clothing, took from beneath the bolster at the head of the bed a folded long white nightshirt, inserted his head and arms into the proper apertures of the nightshirt, removed a pillow from the head to the foot of the bed, prepared the bed then in accordingly, and entered the bed. How? With circumspection as invariably when entering a boat, his own or not his own, with solicitude. The snake spiral springs of the mattress being old, the brass quites and pendant viper radii loose and tremulous under stress and strain, prudently, as entering a lair or ambush of lust or adders, <laughs> lightly, the less to disturb, reverently, the better conception and a birth of consummation of marriage, and breach of marriage, of sleep and death. With what antagonistic sentiments were his subsequent reflections affected? Envy, jealousy, abnegation, equanimity. Why more abnegation than jealousy? Uh, Less envy than equanimity. From outrage matrimony to outrage adultery, there arose naught but outrage copulation. <laughs> Yet, the matrimonial violator of the matrimonially violated had not been outraged by the adulterous violator of the adulterously violated. In what final satisfaction did these antagonistic sentiments and reflections, reduced to their simplest form, converge? Satisfaction at the ubiquity in eastern and western terrestrial hemispheres, in all habitable lands and islands, explored or unexplored, the land of the midnight sun, the islands of the blessed, the isles of Greece, the land of promise, <laughs> of adipose anterior and posterior female hemispheres, <laughs> redolent of milk and honey and of excretory sanguine and seminal warmth, <laughs> reminiscent of secular families of curves of amplitude, insusceptible of moods of impression, <laughs> expressive of moot immutable, mature animality. The visible signs of anti-satisfaction. An approximate erection. <laughs> a solicitous adversion. A gradual elevation. A tentative revelation. A silent contemplation. Then? He kissed the plump, mellow, yellow, smellow melons of her rump on each plump melanous hemisphere, in their mellow yellow furrow, with obscure, prolonged, provocative, melons melanous osculation. The, 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 the visible signs of post-satisfaction. A silent contemplation, a tentative velation, a gradual abasement, a solicitous adversion, a proximate erection. What followed this silent action? Somnolent invocation, less somnolent recognition, incipient excitation, catechetical interrogation. Which event or person emerged as the salient point of this narration? Stephen Dedalus, professor and author. What? 
move visibly above the listeners and the narrator's invisible thoughts. The upcast reflection of a lamp and shade, an inconstant series of concentric circles of varying gradations of light and shadow. In what direction did listener and narrator lie? Listener, southeast by east, narrator, northwest by west, on the 53rd parallel of latitude north and 6th meridian of longitude west at an angle of 45 degrees to the terrestrial equator. In what state of rest or motion? At rest relatively to themselves and to each other, in motion being each and both carried westward, forward, rearward respectively, by the proper perpetual motion of the earth through ever-changing tracks of never-changing space. In what posture? Listener, reclined semi-laterally left, left hand under head, right leg extended in a straight line, and resting on left leg, flexed in the attitude of Gaia Tellus, fulfilled, recumbent, big with seed. Narrator, reclined laterally left, with right and left leg flexed, the index finger and thumb of the right hand resting on the bridge of the nose in the attitude depicted in a snapshot photograph made by Percy Apjohn, the child man weary, the man child in the womb. Womb? Weary? He rests, he has traveled. With Sinbad the sailor and Timbad the tailor and Jinbad the jailer and Winbad the whaler and Ninbad the nailer and Finbad the failer and Binbad the bailer and Pinbad the paler and Minbad the mailer and Hinbad the hailer and Rinbad the jailer and Dimbad the kailer and Binbad the quailer and Linbad the yailer and Shinbad the failer. When? Going to dark bed. There was a square round, Sinbad the sailor, rocks, ox, egg, in the night of the bed, of all the ox, of the rocks, of dark in bad, the bright tailor. Well. Yeah. So here I am again, it's that time of the day. I have to interrupt the magic that Michael and Mal have created to thank a few people, and the list is rather long. This is also a rather strange year, may I say, and I think all of you know why. Normally, when we're approaching the time when we read the Penelope episode, the crowd surges to 500, 600, 700. And we had some folks who departed for Father's Day dinners, and that's fine, and other folks who have to work early tomorrow. The group here, I think many of you have been here all day long, and when we announced as the rain started that we were going to take a little rain break, we suspected we'd lose most of you. And here's what happened instead. First, there's Miriam Spector over there. Miriam is the first reader who's ever gotten the hook while reading. I want to apologize publicly to her, but the rain was starting, and we knew it was going to be a big one. Then I want to thank the rest of you for not disappearing, not going home, not even going around the corner to get a drink. You piled into the lobby, and you waited out the rain. But the person I want to thank most in the audience is Tara, right here in the third row. Because while all of you were crammed into the lobby, Tara was sitting here in the rain waiting for it to end and wondering where everybody else was. Now that's serious devotion. And look, there couldn't be a Bloomsday without an audience. What would be the point? But let me now also thank the readers. There have been over 70 readers this year. As you know, our guest of honor was Ambassador Dan Mulhall of Ireland, who traveled up from Washington to be with us for a couple of hours. Let me thank a few other people briefly who make Bloomsday what it is. There are, of course, the musicians and singers, because Ulysses is a musical book. 
We had Darren Kelly and John McGillian playing during our pauses and enlivening our breaks. We had singers Pascal Spinney, Ethan Vincent, and Corey Bonar of the Academy of Vocal Arts all day long. They were terrific. And pianist Gabe Ribola accompanied them. And not least, we had our own Alex Ames, who helps us bring our collections to life through programs and exhibitions, playing the Celtic harp inside the house. I hope many of you got to see and hear that. I know most of you enjoyed the giant beer garden that our friend Scotes created yet again. That'll be back next year. There are community partners who had tables set up to inform you about their organizations, and I thank them for coming out and helping us to broaden the scope of Bloomsday. There are the funders who help us to keep Bloomsday a free public program for everyone. There are a lot of sponsors this year. I'm just going to mention our lead sponsors, Lenny Steiner and Perry Lerner, Brandywine Realty, and the Government of Ireland. All of our sponsors are mentioned in our brochure, and I do want to thank them all. And now I come to my colleagues here at the Rosenbach and also at the Parkway Central Library at our partner institution, who quite literally put this event together. I'm just going to highlight three of them, although it's a huge team that was at work. Christina Doe is our facilities manager. She was here at 5.30 this morning dealing with five parked cars that were right there in rows one through three. And I'll tell you something else. She hasn't stopped working today, and she'll be here tonight long after all of you are gone. That's incredible devotion. Then there's Ed Pettit. Ed is our program manager. He's in charge of Bloomsday as an intellectual and creative event. And finally, Bethany Chisholm. Bethany is a recent addition to our team, but she's a fantastic logistics person. She's our events manager, and she made all the other parts of Bloomsday function. So I thank the three of them but as stand-ins for everybody. I also want to thank the Rosenbach's board of directors. Almost the entire board was here at one point during the day. I'll highlight just two of them. Arthur Spector is the chair of our board. He's been here all day long. And I have to say, as I say every year, every year it's true, no one did more work than the vice chair of our board, the chair of our Bloomsday Committee, Lenny Steiner. And I'm finally ready to bring it home. Michael Toner, whom you just heard, was with us 27 years ago when we first did Bloomsday, and he and Mal White have really turned Ithaca into something that is not to be missed theater. I thank them for their involvement over the years. They're brilliant and amazing. And now it's time for the 27th year in a row, the person who has come to embody Molly Bloom, the one and only Drusy McDaniel. Give it up. I salute you, valiant rain warriors. Thank you. So, why can't you kiss a man without going and marrying him? First, you sometimes love to, wildly, and when you feel that way so nice all over, you can't help yourself. I wish some man or other would take me some time in his arms when he's, not a, when he's there and kiss me in his arms. Oh, there's nothing like a kiss. Long and hot down to your soul almost paralyzes you. Then, uh, I hate that confession. When I used to go to Father Corrigan, he touched me, Father. And what if he did? Where? And I said, on the canal bank like a fool. <laughs> no, no, but whereabouts on your person, my child? On the lake behind. High up, was it? 
Yes, rather high up. Was it where you sit down? Yes. Oh, Lord, why couldn't he just say bottom like it's everybody else and get on with it? And what right has he got to do that anyway? When, and he, whatever way he put it, I said, oh, no, Father. And I always think of the real Father. What did he want to know when I already, already confessed it to God? He had a nice fat hand, the palm moist always. I wouldn't mind feeling it, neither would he, I'd say, by the bull neck and his horse collar. Oh, I could see his face. He couldn't see mine. I, I of course, he, he'd never let on. Still, his eyes were red when his father died, but they lost for a woman, all of them. It must be terrible when a man cries, let alone one of them. I'd like to be embraced by one in his vestments and the smell of incense off him. Like, uh, there's, besides, there's no danger with a priest because he's too careful about himself. And then I would just give something to H.H. H. the Pope for a penance. I wonder, was he satisfied with me? One thing I didn't like was him slapping me be behind so familiarly in the hall. And though I laughed, I'm not a horse or an ass, am I? Mm, I suppose he was thinking of his father. Is he awake? Is he thinking of me? Is he dreaming of me? Who gave him that flower he said he bought? He smelt of some kind of drink. The, not whiskey or stout, but perhaps the sweety kind of paste they stick their bills up with. With some liquor, I'd like to sip that, some rich-looking green and yellow expensive drinks. Those staged or Johnny's drinks with the up for a hat. I tasted one once with my finger. I dipped it out of that American that had the squirrel. He was talking stamps with father. Oh, all he could do was to keep himself from falling asleep. And after that last time, we took the port and the potted meat, and it had a fine, salty taste, yes because I felt lovely and tired myself and fell asleep as sound as a top the moment I popped straight into bed till that thunder woke me up. Oh, uh, God be merciful to us. I thought the heavens were coming down upon to punish us. I blessed myself. I said, Hail Mary, like those awful thunderbolts that they had in Gibraltar. And then they come and tell you there's no God. <laughs> wait. There's St. George's church bells. Wait. Three quarters the hour. Wait. Two o'clock? Well, that's a nice hour of the night for him to be coming home at, to anybody. And then he looks around the area, if anyone saw him. <laughs> I'll knock him off that little habit tomorrow. First, I'll look in his shirt to see, or, or if he has that French letter still in his pocketbook. I suppose he thinks, I don't know, deceitful men. All their 20 pockets aren't enough for all their lies. Why should we tell them? Even if it's the truth, they don't believe you. And then tucked up in bed like one of those babies in the aristocrat's masterpiece. He brought me another time as if we hadn't enough of that in real life without some old aristocrat or whatever it is named disgusting you with more of those rotten pictures. Children with two heads and, and no legs. Now, that, that's the kind of villainy they're always dreaming about. With not another thing in their empty heads, they ought to get slow poisoned, the half of them. Then tea and toast for him, buttered on both sides, and you laid eggs. I suppose I'm nothing anymore. But I wouldn't let him lick me in Hollis Street one night. Man, man, tyrant as ever. For the one thing, he slept on the floor half the night, naked, the way the Jews used when somebody that dies belongs to them. And he wouldn't eat any breakfast or speak a word, wanting to be petted. So I stood out long enough for one time, and I let him. He does it all wrong, too. Is it, he, I'm thinking only of his own pleasure is his tongue is too flat. Or, I, I don't know what. He forgets the weapon. I don't. I'll make him do it again if he doesn't mind himself. And I'll lock him down to sleep in the coal cellar, cellar with the black beetles. I wonder, was it her, Josie Offerhead, that barmaid that he does? Of course, his wife is always sick or going to be sick or just getting better of it. And he is a good-looking man, though he's getting a bit gray over the ears. They're a nice lot, all of them. Well, they're not going to get my husband again into their clutches if I can help it. Making fun of him, then, behind his back. I know well when he goes on with his idiotics because he has sense enough not to squander every penny piece he earns down their gullets. And he looks after his wife and family. Good for nothings. 
poor Paddy Dignam, all the same. I'm sorry in a way for him. What are his wife and five children going to do unless he was insured? Comical little tea, told him. Always stuck up at some pub corner and her or her son waiting. Little Bailey, won't you please come home? Her widow's weeds won't improve her appearance. They're awfully becoming, though, if you're good looking. What men, wasn't he? Yes. He was at the Glen Cree dinner and Ben Dollard based barrel tone the night he borrowed the swallowtail to sing out in Paula Street, squeezed in and squashed into them and grinning all over his big dolly face like a well-whipped child's body. <laughs> Didn't he look like a balmy bollocks? Sure enough, oh, that must have been a spectacle on the stage. Imagine paying five shillings in the preserved seats for that to see him and Simon Dedalus too. He was always turning up half-screwed, singing in the second verse. Oh, I suppose he's a man now. By this time, he was an innocent little boy then, and a darling little fella in his Lord Fauntleroy suit and curly hair like, like a prince or a, a god or one of the people that should be in those paintings. When I saw him at Matt Dillon's, and he liked me too, I remember, well, they all do. Wait, by God. Yes, wait, hold on. Yes, he was on the cards this morning when I laid out the deck. Union with a young stranger, neither dark nor fair, you met before. I, th I thought it meant him, but he's no chicken. No, no stranger either. And then what was the seventh card after that? That was a ten of spades for a journey by land. And then there was a, a letter on its way and, and scandals too. The three queens and the eight of diamonds for a rise in society. Yes, it all came out. And two red eights for new garments. Look at that. And didn't I dream something too? Yes, there was something about Poetry in it, poetry. I hope he hasn't got long, greasy hair hanging into his eyes or standing up like a red Indian. What do they go about like that for, only getting themselves and their poetry laughed at? I always liked poetry when I was a girl. First, I thought he was a poet, like Lord Byron. Not an ounce of it in this composition. I thought he was quite different. I wonder, if, is he too young? Wait, 88. I was married, 88. Millie is 15 yesterday, 89. So what age was he then at Dylan's? Five or six about? 88? Well, I suppose he's 20 or more. I'm not too old for him. If he's 23 or 24, I hope he's not that stuck up university student sort. No. Otherwise, he wouldn't go sitting down in the old kitchen with him, talking, texting Apes' Coco and talking. Of course, he pretended to be understanding it all, probably told him he was a professor out of Trinity College. Now, he's very young to be a professor. I hope he's not a professor like Godwin was. He was a potent professor of John Jameson. They all write about some woman in their poetry. Well, I suppose they won't find many like me. Where softly sighs of love the light guitar, where poetry is in the air, the blue sea and the moon shining so beautifully, coming back on the night boat from Tarifa, the lighthouse at Yerova Point, the fella that played that guitar, he was so expressive. Will I ever go back there again, all new faces? Two glancing eyes, a lattice hid. I'll sing that for him. They're my eyes if he's anything of a poet. Two eyes as darkly bright as love's own star. It'll be a change, the Lord knows, to have an intelligent person to talk to about yourself, not always listening to him and Billy Prescott's ad and Keyes' ad and Tom the Devil's ad, and then if anything goes wrong in their business, we have to suffer. I'm sure he's very distinguished. Besides, he's young, like those fine young men I could see down in Margaret Strand bathing place from the side of the rock, standing up in the sun, naked, like... God or something, 
and then plunging into the sea with them. Why aren't all men like that? There'd be some consolation to a woman. Like th that lovely little statue that he brought home. No, I could look at him all day. Curly head and his shoulders, his finger up for you to listen. Huh? <laughs> There's real beauty and poetry for you. I often felt I wanted to kiss him all over, his lovely young cock there so simply. And I wouldn't mind taking him in my mouth if nobody was looking. As if it was asking you to suck it so clean and white he looked with his boyish face, I would too in one half of a minute, even if some of it went down. Oh, what? Yes, it's only like gruel <laughs> or the Duke, or, and there's no danger. Besides, he'd be so clean compared with those pigs of men. I suppose they never dream of washing it from one year's end to the other, most of them. Only that's what gives the women the mustaches. I'm afraid of that. Oh, I'm sure it'll be grand if I can only get in with a handsome young poet at my age. I'll throw, I'll throw them in the first thing in the morning and I'll see if the wish card comes out. Or I'll try pair in the lady herself and see if he comes out. I'll read and study all I can, find out, learn a bit off by heart if I knew who he likes. So he won't think me stupid if he thinks all women are the same. I can teach him the other part. I'll make him feel all over him till he have faints underneath me and then he'll probably write about me, lover and mistress publicly too, with our two photographs and all the papers when he becomes famous. Oh. Oh, but what am I to do about him, though? <laughs> no, that's no way for him. He has he no manners, nor no refinement, no, nor, nor nothing in his nature. Slapping us on the behind like that, on my bottom, because I didn't call him Hugh. The ignoramus doesn't know poetry from a, a cabbage. Well, that's what you get for not keeping them in their proper place. Pulling off his shoes and his trousers there on the chair before me, so barefaced without even asking permission and standing out in that vulgar way, a half of a shirt they wear to be admired like a priest or a butcher or those old hypocrites in the time of Julius Caesar. Oh, of course, he's right enough in his way to pass the time with as a joke. Sure, <laughs> but you might as well be in bed with what? With a lion, God, and I'm sure he'd have something better to say for himself, a lion would. Oh, well, hmm. I suppose it's, they were so plump and tempting in me short petticoat, he couldn't resist. They excite myself sometimes. Hmm. It's well for men, all the amount of pleasure they get off a woman's body were so round and white for them always. I wished I was one myself for a change just to try with that thing they have swelling up on you so hard and at the same time so soft when you touch it. My Uncle John has a thing long. I heard those corner boys saying when I was passing the corner on Matterbone Lane. My Aunt Mary has a thing, Harry, because it was dark, and they knew th I was a girl, and was, it was going to make me blush, but it didn't. Why should it either? It's only nature. And he puts his thing long into my Aunt Mary's, etc. and there you go. That's the handle and the sweeping brush all over again. Men again all over. They can pick and choose what they please, a married woman or a fast widow or a girl for their different tastes like those houses round by Irish Street. No, but we're, we're always to be chained up. They're not going to be chaining me up, no damn fear, once I start, I tell you, for stupid husband's jealousy. Why can't we all remain friends over it instead of quarreling? Her husband found out what he did. Well, naturally, and if he did, can he undo it? He's coronado anyway, with whatever he does. And then he go into the other mad extreme about the wife and fair tyrants. Of course, the man never even casts a second thought on the husband or the wife either. It's the woman he wants and he gets her. What else were we given all these desires for? I'd like to know. I can't help it if I'm still young, can I? It's a wonder I'm not an old shriveled hag before me time living with him. 
so cold, never embracing me, except sometimes when he's asleep, the wrong end of me, not knowing, I suppose, who he has. Any man that'd kiss a woman's bottom, I'd throw my hat at him. After that, he'd kiss anything unnatural, where we haven't one atom of any kind of expression in us, all of us the same, two lumps of lard, before I ever do that to a man. <laughs> Dirty brute. Mere thought is enough. I kissed the feet of you, senorita. Ah, uh, well, now, there's some sense in that. And didn't he kiss our hall door? <laughs> yes, he did. What a madman. Nobody understands his cracked ways but me. Still, a woman wants to be embraced 20 times a day almost to make her look young, but no matter by who, so as long as to be in love or loved by somebody, if the fellow you want isn't there, sometimes, by the Lord God, I was thinking, would I go around by the caves there some dark evening where nobody'd know me and pick up a sailor off the sea? <coughs> That'd be hot on for it, and, and not care to pin who I was, only do it up there at a gate or somewhere, or one of those wild-looking gypsies in Rathfarnham had their camp pitched near the Bloomfield Laundry to try and steal our tanks if they could. I only sent mine there a few times for the name, Model Laundry. Sending me back over and over, old ones, old stockings. That blackguard looking fella with the fine eyes, peeling a switch, attack me in the dark, oh, and ride me up against a wall without a word. <laughs> or a murderer. Anybody. What they do themselves, the fine gentlemen in their silk hats, that Casey that lives up somewhere this way, coming out a hard wick lane, the night he gave us the fish supper on account of winning over the boxing match. Now, of course, it was for me that he gave it. I, I knew him by his gaiters and his walk, and when I turned round a minute later just to see, there was a woman coming after him, too, some filthy prostitute. I, then he goes home to his wife after that. Oh, only I suppose half those sailors are rotten again with disease. Uh, oh, come on, shove your big carcass out of the way for the love of Mike. Listen to him. The winds that waft my sighs to thee. <laughs> so well may he sleep and sigh. The great suggester, Don Poldo de la Flora. <laughs> if he knew how he came out on the cards this morning, he'd have something to sigh for. A dark man in some perplexity between two sevens, too. In prison for the Lord knows what he does that I don't know. And I'm to be slooching around down in the kitchen to get his lordship his breakfast while he's rolled up like a mummy? Will I indeed? Did you ever see me run in? I'd like to see myself at it. You show them some attention, they treat you like dirt. I don't care what anyone says, it'd be much better for the world to be governed in by the women. In it, you wouldn't see women going and killing one another and slaughtering. When do you ever see women rolling around drunk like they do or gambling every penny they have and losing it on horses? Yes, because a woman, whatever she does, knows when to stop. Sure, they wouldn't be in this world at all, if not only for us. They don't know what it is to be a woman and a mother. How could they? Where would they be, all of them, if they hadn't had a mother to look after them? What I never had. And that's why he is out running wild now, out at night, I suppose, away from his books and his studies and not living at home on account of the usual rowdy house, I suppose. Well, it's a poor case that those like that have a fine son and they're not satisfied, and I have none. Was he not able to make one? It wasn't my fault we came together when I was watching the two dogs up in her behind, in the middle of the naked street. Huh. Oh, that, that disheartened me altogether. And I suppose I oughtn't to have buried him in that little woolly jacket I knitted, crying as I was. 
but give it to some poor child. But I knew well, I'd never have another. Our first death, too, it was. We were never the same since. Oh, I am not going to think myself into the glooms about that anymore. I wondered why he wouldn't stay the night. I felt all the time it was somebody strange he brought in. Instead of roving around the city, meeting God knows who, night walkers and pickpockets, his poor mother wouldn't like that if she was alive, ruining himself for life, perhaps. Still, it is a lovely hour. So silent, I used to love coming back after dances, the air of the night. They have friends that they can talk to, we've none. Either he wants what he wants and he won't get it, or it's some woman ready to stick her knife into you. I hate that in women. No wonder they treat us the way they do. We are a dreadful lot of bitches. <laughs> I suppose it's all the troubles we have makes us so snappy. I'm not like that. A quarter after. What an unearthly hour. I suppose they're just getting up in China now, combing out their pigtails for the day. We'll soon have the nuns ringing. Angelus, they've nobody coming in and waking them up except the odd priest who wants his coffee, I suppose. Oh, okay, see if I can doze off now. A one, two, three, four, five. What's, what's that kind of flowers are those that they invented? Like the stars on the wallpaper in Lombard Street? That was much nicer. The apron he gave me was like that something. Or I only wore it twice. Better lower this lamp. I'll try it again. One, two, three, four, I love flowers. I'd like to have the whole place swimming in roses. God of heaven, there's nothing like nature. Wild mountains and then the sea and the waves rushing and then the beautiful country with the fields of oats and wheat and all kinds of things and all the fine cattle going about. That would do your heart good to see rivers and lakes and flowers and all sorts of shapes and smells and colors springing up even out of the ditch primroses and violets, nature it is. And as for them saying there's no God, I wouldn't give a snap of my two fingers for all their learning. Why don't they go and create something beautiful? I often ask him, atheists or whatever they call themselves, and go wash the cobbles off themselves first and go howling for the priest and they die in it. Why? Why? Because they're afraid of hell on account of their bad conscience. Ah, yes, I know them well. Who? was the first person in the universe before there was anybody that made it at all. Who? Baha. That they can't tell you. Neither can I. So there you are. Ha! They might as well try to stop the sun from rising tomorrow. The sun shines for you, senorita. <laughs> that it was the day we were lying amongst the rhododendrons on Hout's head in the gray tweed suit and his straw hat. The day I got him to propose to me. First, yes, I gave him a bit of the seed cake out of my mouth. And it was a leap year, like now, yes, 16 years ago. My God, after that long kiss, I near lost my breath. Yes, he said, I was a flower of the mountain. Yes, so we are, flowers all, a woman's body, yes. That was the one true thing he said in his life, that and the sun shines for you today. Yes. That was why I liked him, because I saw he understood or felt what a woman is, and I knew I could always get round him. And I gave him all the pressure I could, leading him on till he asked me to say yes. But I wouldn't answer him at first. I only looked out over the sea 
and the sky. I was thinking of so many things he didn't know of. Mulvey and Mr. Stanhope and Hester and Father and old Captain Groves and the sailors playing all birds fly and I say stoop and washing up dishes, they called it on the pier and the sentry standing in front of the governor's house with the thing round his white helmet, poor devil half roasted, and the Spanish girls laughing in their shawls, their tall combs, and the auctions in the morning, the Greeks and the Jews and the Arabs and the devil knows who else from all the ends of Europe, and Duke Street and the foul market all clucking outside Larry Sharon's, and the poor donkeys slipping half asleep, and the vague fellows in the wheels of the carts of the bulls, and the old castle, thousands of years old, yes, and those handsome moors, all in white and turbans like kings, asking you to sit down in their little bit of a shop, and oh, Rhonda, with the old windows of the Posadas, two glancing eyes, a lattice hid for her lover, to kiss the iron, and the wine shops half open at night, and the castanets, and the night we missed the boat at Algeciras, and the watchman going about serene with his lamp, and oh, that awful deep down torrent, oh yes, and the sea, the sea, crimson sometimes, like fire, and the glorious sunsets, and the fig trees in the Alameda gardens, yes, and all the queer little houses, and pink and blue and yellow and houses in the rose gardens, and the jessamine and the geraniums and the cactuses, and Gibraltar as a girl, where I was a flower of the mountain. Yes, when I put the rose in my hair, like the Andalusian girls used, or shall I wear red? Yes, how oh, he kissed me under the Moorish wall. And I thought, well, as well him as another. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again. Yes. And then he, he asked me, would I to, to say, yes, my mountain flower. And first, I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume, yes. <laughs> His heart was going like mad. And yes, I said. Yes, I will. Yes. Yes, indeed. Let's bring Drusy back, give her some flowers, and tell her again how much we appreciate her being Molly Bloom. <laughs> and now I have two more requests. We're not quite done yet. The second request is you all know that we end Bloom's Day with a rendition of Love's Old Sweet Song. So you've waited nine hours. It was the earliest start ever and the latest finish ever. You can hang out a few more minutes. The first request is give yourselves a hand for being an incredible closing audience. <laughs> Love's Old Sweet Song.
days beyond recall when on the world the mists began to fall out of the dreams that rose in happy throng lo to our hearts love sang an old sweet song and in the dusk where fell the firelight's gleam softly it wove itself into a dream just a song at twilight when the lights are low and the flickering shadows softly come and go though the the day and long still to us a twilight comes love's old song comes love's old sweet song even today we hear love song of yore deep in our hearts it dwells forevermore dreams that rose in happy throng still we can hear it at the close of day so till the end when life's dim shadows fall love will be found the sweetest song of all just a song at twilight when the lights are low and the flickering shadows softly come and go though the heart be weary sad the day and long still to us a twilight comes love's old song Here we are. Everybody. <laughs> Go ahead. Here we are together to say thank you again for being with us today and for supporting us. We look forward to seeing you lots of times over the coming year. Don't be strangers, but we especially look forward to seeing you next Flutes Day. Thank you again. Yeah.